Well, when I was a little boy sitting on my mind. Hello, I'm Marcy Sclove. Welcome to Going Deeper. Today I'm sitting with Rabbi Ben Weiner, the spiritual leader of the JCA, Jewish Community of Amherst. Rabbi Ben Weiner is also uh, very much known in the Valley for being a beautiful musician. He is a homesteader, uh, sustaining it with food on his farm. And he is a scholar in Irish and Yiddish literature, also a, a prolific writer. I've been reading some of your things. He's also quite a mensch and a great sense of humor, and I'm very happy to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to be here. So I often start these with the question about your early life and how your early life informed all the work that you do now. Simply put, I think it's, I was raised in a f relatively traditional Jewish household, mm -hmm. uh, and that formed a kind of a cultural and spiritual and even a social basis for my experience of life, such that no matter how far I wandered from it later on, mm -hmm. uh, and I did <laughs> yeah. wander from it, yeah. it was something that it felt right to return to eventually mm -hmm. and to situate myself as an adult uh, hmm. in relationship to, so that all the different things that I ended up learning ended up, I think, relatively sensibly, uh, if not entirely seamlessly, then being things I could bring back to my Jewish point of origin and then uh, becoming a rabbi work with in a Jewish context. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes uh, a Jewish childhood is pretty much in the realm of, you know, kind of the prayer and all of, the, all of that stuff. But where do you think your spiritual depth came from in, mm. in that early life? Uh, I don't know who's going to watch this, so ah. you know what I should say, what I shouldn't say. I think that uh, one of the problems that set me wandering at mm -hmm. a certain point was mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a lack of, of what you might call spirituality yeah. in, the, in, the, in the context of my growing up. I certainly learned a great deal. I became very proficient in Jewish languages and texts and culture and familiarity with, with the modes of Jewish prayer. And in, in addition, I had rabbis when I was younger who I still remember with great fondness as being important influences on me. But I can't necessarily say that I would sit in a, uh, my standard, you know, late 20th century uh, big synagogue service and yeah. think I'm really in touch now with the source of all, right. all being. Right. Um, and so I think if nothing else, the upbringing kind of fomented a sense of spiritual crisis uh -huh, <laughs> in, that, uh -huh. in that the things that were being proposed as reality, such as the existence of an anthropomorphic deity and, right, and right, et cetera, right. um, while I was expected to believe them and intellectually did believe them, they seemed less and less tenable the older I got. That actually really rings true for my own experience. I, I can relate to that. There was a yearning of something not, not gotten from the religious experience. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really interesting. So I know that, you know, you went to college and you studied Irish uh, literature in Dublin and had this whole life. And then why did you decide to become a rabbi? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I refer to my resume as kind of like the story of a dilettante on some <laughs> level. There's a little bit of everything in it. Yeah. And I think that speaks, I think, to both the wide ranging curiosity and a certain lack of focus uh, and mm -hmm. a certain diffuse sense of purpose, you know, through my, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. through my 20s. Um, uh, I, I tried a number of different things, um, including the different types of study, academic study, yeah. including freelance writing and translating, including some teaching. Um, and none of it kind of coalesced into a career picture. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. first and foremost, I think it's People are always surprised to hear me say this. It was a career choice. Sure. Like, what am I going to do with my life? I get that. That's yeah. That's going to be going to be meaningful and important, and draw upon the skill set that I've that I have mm -hmm. as scatters as mm -hmm. it is. And lo and behold, the rabbinate uh, seemed <laughs> to offer that um, uh, in terms of being an intellectual position right. with a lot of opportunity to uh, to read and write mm -hmm. and teach. 
but then also, uh, as opposed to academia, being a pastoral position as well, sure. in which the day-to-day -day relationships with other people wasn't about the academic subject as much as it was life experience. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also the, the music as right. well. Jew Judaism is a very musical, spiritual tradition. Yeah. Uh, and so it seemed, in the final analysis, as a, as a place that I could go to earn a reasonable livelihood as an right. adult and at the right. same time not sell my soul entirely right, right, and also right. draw upon all the different things that I care about. Yeah, so you have really taken music and made it even richer in the JCA context. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing there? And sure, what that's well firstly about? it's a very musical congregation, yeah. so it's not as if I invented music at the JCA. <laughs> I, in fact, I think a lot of what I've been able to do is because of how musical a congregation it is. I mean, it, I often joke, it's a place where they start, if you're teaching them a new song, mm -hmm. they start to sing it even before you're done <clears throat> teaching it to them. And yeah. once or twice I've actually written a song, <laughs> started to teach it, they start to sing it right away. I'm like, you don't know this song, I just wow. made it up. But, <laughs> but they still like to sing. Um, yeah. So J Jewish spirituality is based in prayer, and prayer is a combination of words and music. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, in, in many types of Jewish spirituality, it's not as if the music is only important because it helps you to sing the words. I think there's actually a, a reciprocal relationship between the words and the music, mm -hmm. such that each of them carries the burden of the spiritual expression. Right. For many modern Jews, I think the music is actually even more significant as a spiritual avenue than the words, because the words, given that they are, are shaped by a spiritual tradition that's so old, Mm -hmm. don't always immediately speak to someone in the present day. Yeah. Whereas the music instantly, in many cases, can grab the emotions, can grab the spirit and take them on, on their journey. Mm -hmm. And it's also true for me. Right. Uh, I grapple with the words sometimes in terms of what they mean to me, but the music, if it's good, which yeah. it usually is, is usually very immediately present to me. Isn't there also a component of just the vibrational aspects of the the words in music that that creates a sort of a phenomenon in the body it, that be that it, it touches it a be. spiritual I think, place. I think for people that don't necessarily understand the words, I think it's even easier in yeah. that regard because yeah. they're just sounds. Um, yeah. When you understand the words, it's a challenge. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Because the words sometimes have to be worked with in order to really right. uh, attach to them spiritually. But but so my goal at the JCA has been to really enhance the music, um, in part by bringing in musical instruments, mm -hmm. which has always been something of a tension point in hmm. Jewish services, which have traditionally been a cappella. Even in a s congregation as relatively progressive as the JCA, it took some uh, Is that because of uh, not doing work during the There's Sabbath? There's been a variety of, um, variety of reasons why mm -hmm. that's developed. That's one of the main ones, um, the notion that <clears throat> On the Sabbath, you're supposed to refrain from all types of work activity. Mm -hmm. And the concern actually is not so much the playing of the instrument as that the instrument might break and you then have to fix it. Oh, wow. <laughs> or you might have to carry it to get to the synagogue. Right. So it's almost these kind of subsidiary concerns. Sure. In sure. addition, there's been uh, a kind of mournful character to Jewish spirituality mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. a long time uh, because uh, of the destruction of the temple 2,000 years ago. Right and then the subsequent difficult experiences that Jews have had. Right. And, and there was always a notion that instruments is a little too celebratory. Oh, they did that yeah. in the temple, but the temple has been destroyed, and now we have this kind of mournful cast to, yeah. to our Interesting. culture. Uh, and in addition, aesthetically, it's kind of, the a cappella part is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. It ends up being voices blending with each other, just the simple, you know, unadorned, quality of human voices right. raised in singing together. So I'm thinking about that mournful quality because there's also in the Hasidic tradition a joyful quality mm -hmm. of the music. And talk a little bit about the third Friday night Shabbat thing that goes on at the JCA. Well, so just the Hasidic point I yeah. think is interesting because it, absolutely in the Hasidic tradition, I don't know how much backstory we have time to give to that tradition, but it is very much an emphasis on joy, but it's pretty clearly the imperative of joy in difficult circumstances, okay. which I think is what Hasidism is, is all about, at least in essence. Like yeah. you, uh, uh, Rabbi Nachman, who said, it, you must be joyful. It's mm -hmm. a command. Mm -hmm. And when something's a command, it's not always easy to do. Sure. So, so I think that 
part of the Hasidic attitude of joy is precisely emerging out of uh, something you might call a despair or wow. a difficulty I and trying to that. push through that into these uh, transports uh, yeah. of joy. So even then, it's sure. not as simple as it seems. I get, yeah. Um, the third Friday night, this is a plug, I guess. For the, uh, yes, it is. <laughs> the third Friday night of every month at the JCA is what we call Shabbat Ne'ima, which means the Shabbat of, of pleasing melody. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think that every service has pleasing melody. Right. So this is just the branding, you know, logo sure. essentially. But, <laughs> but um, we have wonderful, uh, I'm going to call them amateur musicians just because they don't get paid to be musicians, but they're greatly skilled musicians. Yeah. But they're all members of the community. Mm -hmm. And we get together in a, in a band. Uh, with guitars and bass and, and percussion and accordion and, and singers. Yeah. And we uh, explore uh, a certain legacy of, of, of uh, Jewish communal song, hmm. or sacred song. Yeah. Uh, a combination of some of the melodies go back hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, again, occasionally one of them I wrote, you know, a right. week before, right. or they come from a kind of a contemporary milieu of synagogue music. And... Uh, it's a traditional Jewish service, you know, if you were to say, was this done? Yes, it was. Everything is done. Sure. But it's, it's in this context of, of contemporary music without being like a rock show and without right. being like overly cheesy. Like, I think we, we managed to strike a really good. One performance. time I was there and I loved uh, the Leonard Cohen yes, thing well, you did. And I know you thought that would be a real crowd pleaser. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we consider Leonard Cohen a Jewish liturgist and, sure. and uh, yeah. a psalmist, essentially. Yeah. So especially after he died, uh, we did a special tribute with a couple of his melodies, oh, cool. setting, uh, setting, setting prayers yeah. to some of his melodies. The other thing that I relate to it is the, um, the Hindu kirtan mm -hmm. uh, tradition, which again, it's, it's the, doing the Sanskrit names of, of the divine and there is this sort of vibrational aspect to repeating and repeating and mm -hmm. music and all the rest of it. But it's, to me, I think of it as Jewish kirtan. Well, uh, in, in our kind of postmodern situation yeah. in which every culture is, has the opportunity to partake of every other culture, right. at least to some extent, there are other religious musics that are definitely influencing the way we understand synagogue music today, including kirtan, including sure. gospel. Sure, gospel uh, would be the other one. So, yeah, sure. So uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a coincidence to right. some extent. Right. The kirtan yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about farming and how you came to that and what it means to you and... Also, how it um, how it relates to the spiritual aspect of, of your work. Sure, I like to joke the two things I was probably voted least likely to be when I was a child were as a rabbi and a farmer, and now I've managed wow. to become both of them. Wow! Um, I you know I can find photos when I was a kid, really young kid, of we had a little vegetable garden at the house, and I had like a little corn patch, which I thought was kind of semi mythological until I found a photo of it, my little corn patch, and <laughs> very very small corn patch. But um, I had no real relationship to to gardening or farming for for much of my life until mm -hmm. about ten to twelve years ago, and at first it was purely kind of a, an intellectual response to my concerns about the state of the planet, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of climate change and other ecological, uh, you know, uh, catastrophes that we could, you know, list mm -hmm. and, and resource depletion and things like that. And thinking, well, what's the, given the enormity of the problem, what's one thing I could do to sort of walk a little, yeah. walk a little step here. And so that I'll, I'll have a little vegetable garden. Yeah. And, um, my, my I was in Philadelphia at the time in rabbinical school, and my friend uh, was living in a house with a lawn, and she gave me a part of her lawn, mm. and I began to garden. With, uh, I had one in particular mentor, also in rabbinical school, who was a second career person who had been a back to the lander in a previous oh, wow. life. So she took me under her wing, kind of became my earth mother with regard That's to gardening, fantastic. and got me, got me started. Yeah. And uh, I, I loved having a garden. Uh, in addition to whatever it did for me spiritually in regard to the, you know, the grave concerns I have about our fate as a species, mm -hmm. I also just liked, you know, having fresh produce coming I out of know. the earth, you know, yeah. and being responsible for it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I grew this, you know, I grew that. Like it's a, yeah. I come in with a basket of food that you grew mm -hmm. yourself. It's a, it's an experience that wasn't so uncommon to the human experience for right. centuries till now, but now it's got this, because of the trajectory by which we might come to it, it's got right. a, a different specialness. Um, 
those concerns didn't go away. Right. Uh, and at the same time, uh, a passion for the work uh, increased. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, also a, a capacity for the work, mm -hmm. like actually being mm -hmm. pretty decent at, oh, at a lot of it. Uh, and so um, to the point that when I was looking around for a, a rabbinic job, and I saw one opening here in Amherst, before I even yeah. knew the community, I knew about this area as being an agricultural sure. area. And I was like, well, I want to live there. Oh. Uh, even before I knew I wanted to work That's here. That's so cool. And so um, I came to the, to the valley, and it turns out the synagogue was a good fit, which was a relief. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also uh, sublet a place for a year, which was a working homestead, and took it over for the people that were going on sabbatical. Yeah. And then we bought our own property out in Deerfield, which yeah. I've been developing as a, as a small homestead farm for about six years. Yeah. And the spiritual component, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it continues to be where I put my energy when I'm concerned about the world. Like, mm -hmm. I think just before I mm -hmm. came here, I read a new report about species extinction, which kind of... Yeah. Wipes me out when I read something like that. Yeah. Just, just uh, what, what am I, what am I going to do about that? Yeah. And I don't know what I'm going to do about that. Right. But at the very least, I'm going to have this, you know, little piece of the earth that I'm responsible right. for. And the way that I, I farm it is such that I, I try my best to share it with every other creature that needs it. Uh, so that um, <laughs> I love to bring out my own food, and I also love when I see like a monarch butterfly, you know, fly past, or mm -hmm. when, when bees are foraging, or when there's other animals that can come there and. Unless they're eating my food. Which okay, case really? Upset. I'm thinking the yeah. deer? Really? You're welcoming them? Trying to them. find the deer, you know. <laughs> the deer. Except for the deer, I should say. And those but, worms. Yeah, but when it feels like a healthy piece of land, yeah. you know, um, yeah. both because it's feeding me and my family and also because it's, it's not poisoning other creatures. Sure. Uh, that, that is the, probably the spiritual component, is that's where I've gone with all of this, you know, despair mm -hmm. uh, that I might mm -hmm. be feeling. It's like, well, this is my, this is my responsibility. Yeah. This is what feeds me, and I do my best to take care of it. Yeah. On, on just a practical daily level, too, I can imagine reading the newspaper and then, you know, the act of going outside and picking beans or weeding the garden, it's like brings you to the present moment in a way that helps with the despair. That's right. That's right. Keeps me keeps me out of trouble. I like to say. Yeah, you know? yeah. It, it's also it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. um, and so it's uh, it uh, it uses a lot of my energy, which you know might otherwise be spent worrying or or something else less productive. <laughs> yeah. You also once told me this wonderful story about your son, and uh, can you share that story about? Do you remember? No. Which one was this it? This story about him putting the dirt all oh, over yeah. him and. <laughs> I don't know if he'll like that I share this. Well, he's only four, so what yeah. Um, he, my son likes to say, he likes to look me in the eyes and say, Dad, farming's not my thing. Yeah. Like that's, that's how he likes to stick the knife in a little bit. <laughs> uh, but then once, you know, he says it's not his thing, and yet this is where he's growing up. This is what he takes for granted, mm -hmm. um, which wasn't what I got into it for. But now that I have a child, I feel like, well, that's a great value sure. add. So I, we went outside once, and I was doing some work, and he went over to hang out, like, in the shed or the greenhouse. Um, and I come over, and he's got these handfuls of dirt, and he's just putting them on his head and rubbing them all over his face. And he's just like, <laughs> he's being one with the earth, you know, yeah. just with this kind of look, this, this trance-like look in his face, wow. this transportation. he's in the zone. I think it's because kids love to get dirty, maybe. I don't know what it was. But yeah. for whatever reason, you know, that's, I, I mean. It I, spoke to you. It spoke to me. It's like, okay, you say farming's not your thing, but you're, sure. you're rubbing yourself in the dirt here. So Yeah, and something. it will be interesting to see how, you know, 20, 30 years from now, somebody asking him, how does your work, how was your work informed by your early life? You know, like, that's why I'm a stockbroker. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he's going to say. Oh, dear. Yeah. I hope not. Me too. Wow. Okay. So you started to touch a little bit about the despair. And uh, we are in an unusual period now. I mean, it's always been bad, but it seems like it's gotten a little worse mm -hmm. in these Trump, uh, this Trump era. Um, so has, has anything changed in your, you know, in your presentation at the JCA or how you speak about things or are people freaked out and how do you calm them or mm -hmm. what's your, like the social justice aspects related to politics and sure. that stuff? Um, 
A religious community, I think, has a complicated, multifaceted role to play at all times, and perhaps in particular in times of you know, social, ecological, political uh, destabilization. <laughs> um, in rabbinical school, one of my professors ha helpfully phrased the question as, as being, there's a kind of a spectrum between the pastoral and the prophetic, is what, okay. what he said, okay. um, in terms of the work of a congregational rabbi. The pastoral function is when your primary goal is that people come into your space and they feel safe, they mm -hmm. feel loved, they mm -hmm. feel heard, they feel connected. Uh, and the prophetic is, uh, in the tradition of the Hebrew prophets, is when you get up there and you say, this is what is right and this is what is wrong. You're either yeah. with me or you're against me. Yeah, wow. Um, and uh, what I was taught is that a rabbi has to be somewhat careful in, yeah. in uh, how uh, he or she, uh, or any additional pronouns, uh, then yeah. uh, um, stakes out the role with regard to that polarity. Mm -hmm. So uh, the one thing I find helpful in the JCA and so far as possible is to avoid taking stands in relationship to particular political individuals mm -hmm. um, or yeah. political parties. Uh, oh, okay. trying to step away from sort of naked partisanship and how I articulate. Uh, uh, because you never know, it is Amherst. It, yeah. These are, you know, they are Jews, they are progressives. Sure. But you never know. Oh, sure, you there's never some know, Republicans yeah, who, in what, what are the political allegiances of your, <laughs> of course. Of your community? Yeah. And, if you're, and I think the congregational rabbi should, be, should err on the side of the pastoral because there are a right. few places of refuge uh, in this society and the synagogue should be one of them. So, so uh, on the one hand, it's to try my best to avoid naked partisanship and the identification yeah. of particular individuals as being the problem. Yeah. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think it's important to articulate the issues and to speak to the issues and to try my best to explain why should we care about issues such as this uh, from this perspective mm -hmm. out of a sense of, of Jewish values mm -hmm. or religious commitment. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I try to do. You know, there's a, a very big uh, kind of teaching in the 12-step 12, 12 tradition that says um, principles over personalities. Mm -hmm. Stick with principles. Don't get involved in the personalities. And this is sort of the same thing. Yeah, I would say I didn't know that. That's helpful yeah. also. Yeah. Um, so, so what I do is uh, try my best to articulate those positions. Mm -hmm. And if those positions and that articulation of them means you should vote one way versus the other, mm -hmm. so be it. Uh, uh, so I, I wouldn't, you know, there's certain, you know, uh, issues of tax exempt status where I have to avoid endorsing certain political situations from oh, the BIMA. Yeah. Um, but, but if from, a, from an argument from values, from an argument from issues, mm -hmm. you say like, well, if you vote for this person, this is the policy they've said they're going to institute. How, do you, how does that square mm -hmm. with, um, with, with what we've articulated as being the important value yeah. here? Yeah. That's when I would be more comfortable making a, more of an overt political statement. Sure. But the, the issue of pastoral and prophetic also comes back again to what is spirituality in these times? To what extent is spirituality providing a refuge from despair yeah. or some kind of a spiritual context in which you can feel something different? Uh, and then to what extent is it meant to motivate people to go out into the world right. and try to, try to affect change? And the answer is yes, both, obviously, oh. but mm -hmm. they have to be in balance with each other. Sure. Um, because we're not just a political advocacy organization. Uh, and at the same sure. time, I think Martin Luther King said that a, uh, a house of worship that, that loses its, its mission for the betterment of society becomes a glorified social club. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting. And so trying to find yeah. what is the appropriate balance in which both of those factors, which are very much needed in our times, yeah. are given their, their best expression. There's another sort of side effect or consequence of, of these times that I've been seeing is just the intense collaboration going on with other faith communities. And, you know, we joked a couple of times that, wow, the Jews and the Muslims are, you know, they have, they have a way of getting together now that's beautiful and supportive of each other. And, and I've been to some of those events um, and had, you know, some folks on the show. 
Um, do you, is there, is there that kind of thing going on at the JCA, that kind of reaching out and collaborating with? Yes, them? absolutely. Yeah. Um, there, there are two different types of kind of interfaith networking that we're involved with. One on the clergy level, I meet mm -hmm. with my, with my counterparts in, in other, other uh, houses of worship. And then mm -hmm. also there's a, a kind of a, a lay leader group that also meets on a regular basis. Right. I, I agree with you. I think if you want to talk about silver linings, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's really the sense of people need to connect with each other. Right. Uh, whether that is across boundaries, so, so to speak, or across lines of identity, yeah. or it's just people that, you know, back when they thought everything was fine and good, which it wasn't during the Obama administration, right. Right. Um, they thought, okay, it's all fine and good. Obama's in the White House. I can just go back to watching TV or whatever. Sure. Uh, now, the fact that it isn't okay has been brought to the fore and more striking you know, relief. And so people feel the need to get up and collaborate with each other, yeah. which is something of a silver lining. I think so. I think there are some silver linings. Just how much people are... Uh, also getting into activism individually and, and as groups, it's, it's kind of inspiring mm -hmm. to see. And uh, I think it makes everybody feel a little more empowered, a little mm -hmm. more able to be part of something good instead of something not good. Um, There's a Yiddish expression to the effect that a, a shared sorrow is half a comfort. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, that's right. That speaks to it a little bit. Sure. Well, good. Um, we are getting toward the end of part one, and we will continue this um, in part two. So thank you, and we'll see you all in part two. Thank you. Well, when I was a little boy sitting on my mama's knee she said, son, let me tell you about that bad staggerly. She said, son, he was a bad man, Lord, the baddest man I know. Oh.